So today I wanted to talk about a topic that I'm actually quite passionate about um, and it's, it's something that affects all of us in the clinic setting or from a patient perspective, being a woman with epilepsy. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, um, paying respects to elders past, present and emerging, and in particular extending my respects to um, patients from Aboriginal or Torres Strait background um, who are in the audience today. So um, most talks start with the traditional disclosures, and I guess I have to give you the most obvious disclosure, which is that I am a woman and everything in this talk is coloured by um, being a mother, being a doctor, but also um, a sister and a daughter. And um, it heavily influences how I practice medicine in my clinic. I, I don't have any other disclosures, no financial disclosures importantly, because frankly, I'm not really important enough, but anyway. <laughs> Um, and in, with respect to this talk format, what I wanted to break it down into is what I think, looking at the literature, that neurologists think you want to hear. And then I wanted to focus on what you've told me in the clinic setting you want to hear, what you want to talk about. And then finally, what I think we should all be talking about together as a group. About four years ago, there was an excellent um, article in The Guardian talking about the female problem when it comes to medicine. Dr. Kate Young, um, a researcher at Monash University, commented that we're existing in a sphere um, of traditional Eurocentric medicine where we're working in a structure that was created by men, technically for men. So it should be mentioned that I'm focusing on Eurocentric medicine because traditional medical teaching over the last 200 years or so has really focused on male medical students, male anatomy, male problems, whereas traditional forms of medicine have often recognised that difference between men and women. So what we have is that studies have often not included women. So looking at the 1960s, 1980s, for example, there's quite a famous um, research project where there was a recognition that estrogen may actually have protective effects when it comes to cardiovascular disease. So what did the researchers do? They enrolled 13,000 men and gave them estrogen and did not enroll a single woman. So um, there's many stories like that uh, and thankfully, uh, due to a group of, you know, sort of pioneers, you typically female researchers or scientists in the 1980s, the focus has shifted and now we're looking at women um, in particular uh, and recognising that there probably is a difference, as we always know. So um, are we different to men? Obviously we are. There are unique biological changes that we undergo, unique responses to disease processes, and there are also unique responses to medications. Fortunately, the literature has also demonstrated that. So um, this is uh, a study uh, here from the early sort of, um, sorry, from about 2010, but it was really around 2005, that we recognised that even non-neurological diseases had a gender difference. So cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death in all, in all sexes, uh, but multiple studies have shown that women are, are more likely to delay their hospital presentation, resulting in poorer outcome. And then questions arise as to why is that? Why are we reacting differently to this very important cardiological presentation? Similarly, in non-epileptic neurological conditions, we've come really far and recognised that inflammatory diseases such as multiple sclerosis are much more likely to affect women. They're also more likely to be um, active in our reproductive years and important research is being conducted recognising the hormonal influences with respect to this um, process. Finally, migraine, which is not really meant to be a discriminating illness in that it's very ubiquitous, it affects a lot of patients, it affects a lot of neurologists as well. There is a very clear gender difference with women being three to four times likely to suffer from migraine and also to have a much more severe course with respect to migraine. And hot off the press, ultra high field 7T MRI, which is the mother of all MRIs, which can give us a lot of detail with respect to the brain. Just so you know, when they first started out, um, the MRI was 0.5 to 1 Tesla. And at, at the moment we're at 7, so you can see we've, we've come far, has shown what we always suspected. Yes, ladies, your brain is changing size depending on your menstrual cycle. So what is actually happening, there's functional changes to our brain, but there's also physical changes to our brain as well. And this is exciting because it could potentially lead to affecting um, a research with respect to psychiatric and neurological disease. So glancing at the literature in a very sort of casual way, I just typed in women with epilepsy just to get a gauge as to what I think neurologists think you want to hear in the clinic. And what I found was 
it looks like babies, 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 maybe a little bit on contraception, a bit on bone health, and then in the fine print, maybe a little bit on menopause. And this is in stark contrast to what we talk about in clinic um, with um, my patients, where often, yes, we're talking about babies, but we're also talking about all the other things that come along with being a woman with epilepsy. For example, relationships, contraception, menopause, the psychological aspects to epilepsy. Now, each of these is in fact a talk amongst um, of themselves. And so I'm just going to gently touch on some of the research with respect to the different areas. And I'm afraid I think I'm going to raise probably more questions than answers, but it's important that we have this conversation. So there's different types of women, different types of epilepsy, and the different topics I'm going to talk about, I'm splitting into three broad categories. Uh, so what we have here is um, the idea that a woman's life is broken up into three stages, the maiden, the mother, and the more experienced woman. Um, uh, and uh, I just make reference here to the, the weird sisters from Macbeth. What are these so withered and so wild in their attire the, that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are on it? And the idea is, is that we have different hormonal processes during these three stages. So the first stage uh, is when we are post-puberty uh, or, or around the pubertal time. And one of the hot topics really is that of catamenial epilepsy. And some of you have probably heard me mention this in clinic or you've brought it up with me because you've read about it and you're wondering if this is influencing your seizures. So Herzog is a neurologist in 1997 who really first uh, categorised catamenial epilepsy and it's the idea that your seizures are doubling depending on a stage within your menstrual cycle. So as you can see, there are two big stages or, or, or changes with respect to hormones in your menstrual cycle. Uh, you have the menstruation, and then you have your ovulatory phase, and then you also have your secretory phase dependent on those hormonal changes. And there are three major groups that women may or may not fall into. So women can have an increase in their seizures around the perimenstrual time the ovulatory time or the luteal phase. And you're probably thinking, well, doesn't that include the whole 28 day cycle? And it does, <laughs> essentially. So um, it's not surprising that up to 44 to 56% of women report a catamenial component to their epilepsy, essentially. Treatment approaches with respect to catamenial epilepsy depend on whether or not you can reliably predict your period. That's, that's it, essentially. If you have irregular menses, then what we can try is stopping the menstruation with hormonal therapy and seeing if that improves your epilepsy. If you have regular menses, then what we can do is we can either try a short course of hormonal therapy or we can try a short course of anti-seizure medication. Unfortunately, and I suspect that some of the epileptologists in the room and also you as patients have experienced that the um, success rate has, I guess, probably been moderate or minimal at best. And oftentimes um, it's, it doesn't work in the way that you read about in the articles. OK, but might be worth a go. And that's why it's important that we always look back at the evidence. What have we been doing for the past 30 to 40 years? This is a recent Cochrane review. I say recent, about eight years ago, uh, where they looked at about 63 studies and they found that they were actually um, very poorly designed and it was very difficult to draw conclusions from the study. And uh, most of them, the ones that were designed well, so, so they were randomized control trials, showed that there was no real difference between placebo and the hormonal treatment. So maybe doesn't really work. But I think it's important to recognise that these trials are small, so we may be missing things. They're not powered correctly. And because of that, I guess what you don't want to do is draw the conclusion that it's not worth a go because we might be missing very small, unique treatment effects. Even if the response rate is 1%, if you're part of that 1%, that means 100% to you, essentially. Okay. Uh, the important thing to take away from the trials is that there was no um, horrible side effects and it was something that perhaps you can, give, you can discuss with your neurologist or epileptologist at the time. I just wanted to touch very briefly on contraception because I'm mindful that Dr. Gaitatsis has recently given you a talk on pregnancy and epilepsy and contraception and epilepsy. 
it's um, important to bring it up in your clinic visit because there are certain medications that will affect uh, the efficacy of the oral contraceptive pill in particular. And you just have to be mindful that your um, epileptologist is aware of this and also discuss with your general practitioner if there are alternate forms of contraception that you may need to try, for example, an intrauterine device or barrier method. So now we're moving on to the second stage. And again, I'm not going to spend too long on this because I know you've had a, a recent talk on this, but this is probably where you as a woman are thinking that maybe a baby might not be so bad. So that is me um, down the bottom with my second pregnancy. And no, I did, I did not have twins. <laughs> as many people asked me, and I was just in my third trimester then. Um, but you'll see a photo of the baby that came out later. So uh, I guess that one of the important questions that you might ask your epileptologist in clinic is, uh, does epilepsy actually decrease fertility? So we used to think in the 90s and early 2000s that it did. And these studies came out of the United Kingdom and Scotland, where they looked at women uh, particularly over the age of 25, and there was a suggestion that uh, fertility rates were lower and that there was a reduced live birth rate. The problem with just looking at literature at its face value is we often don't look at the context. So the anti-seizure medications used at that time are different to the ones that we're using now, 20 or 30 years later, and there were also probably incorrectly um, significant psychosocial factors that would influence a woman at that time to not have a baby. So fast forward uh, to 2018 and Dr. Paige Pennell, who's sort of a, a lioness in um, epilepsy research when it comes to uh, women with epilepsy, very focused on pregnancy and fertility, showed with her group that um, if you really hone in and you select a group of women who want to fall pregnant and compare them to women without epilepsy, there's no significant difference. There's no significant difference in the ovulatory rates and there's no significant difference in time to achieving pregnancy, which is very reassuring and something that we should bear in mind when we meet in the clinic setting. When it comes to um, pregnancy, if there's one slide that I want you to remember, it's this one. Over 90% of pregnancies in epilepsy are normal, which is very reassuring. The differences are really confined to your anti-seizure medication exposure, um, and it's really significant with respect to valproate and polypharmacy. And I think we're really moving forward in uh, supporting our women, explaining to them what anti-seizure medications are safe, or safer, and also recognising that we may have to monitor more closely things like levels and vitamin replacement. Seizures during pregnancy um, are also um, extremely important to recognise, and these are the risk factors for your seizures worsening during pregnancy. So unfortunately, if you have focal epilepsy, it is more likely that your seizures will worsen. If you're on multiple different forms of medication, that's probably an indicator that your epilepsy is slightly more difficult to control. And that can also increase your risk of seizures during pregnancy. And also how, you've, um, how your epilepsy has gone in the year before you conceive is particularly important. You'll see lots of different stats with respect to seizure frequency in women with epilepsy during pregnancy. And I do remember one of um, the more senior epileptologists uh, saying, probably to me about two years ago, he really discusses things in the rules of thirds, where about 30% stay the same, 30% worsen, 30% get better. And I think if you look at all the studies, that's probably roughly correct, bearing in mind that um, you may just need to have a bit more of a closer chat with your um, epileptologist and look at you as an individual because those, those statistics don't apply to um, individual cases. Now, how is the world going with respect to care patterns um, and epilepsy uh, with when you're pregnant? Well, um, this was actually really surprising. A European study looked at about uh, 60 or so women between the years of 2019 and 2020, and they found that only half of them had actually had a discussion preconception about epilepsy and pregnancy, which is surprising because this is quite a new study from um, 2020, and you would think that uh, your epileptologist and you would have sat down and had a discussion about planning. So it's, it's something that we probably need to be more mindful of in Western Australia. Uh, we, unfortunately, we don't really have the data with respect to that, but I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the talk about things that we can improve and things that we probably need to look at. Now, 
the later years, the third stage, or as I like to refer it, my dream. I often talk about my um, retirement plan. So for the for those of you not familiar with this excellent TV show up the top there, it's The Golden Girls, and I've learned valuable life lessons from this TV show. Really wonderful. Uh, just below there is actually a group of women in the United Kingdom who probably watched the same TV show and decided to purchase a retirement village together so that they could live together and have their golden years, which I think is such a great idea. And then finally, that's essentially my retirement plan. So those of you who know me well know that I'm pretty keen on pyjamas, wearing boots and also looking after my chickens. So <laughs> that's how I see things turning out for me. Um, so the elephant in the room, uh, when I look at research with respect to women with epilepsy is menopause. We're touching on it, but we're not really necessarily addressing it. There's unfortunately minimal research evidence with respect to hormone replacement therapy. There's minimal evidence looking at definitions with respect to perimenopause, premenopause, postmenopause. And I can sense the frustration in the clinic setting from my patients that we're not talking more about this. Um, it's important to recognise because um, the last probably, oof, I guess, um, uh, research group to look at this is Cynthia Harden out of New York. And that article, oh no, I'm struggling to see the year. Yeah, 1999. So, um, as, and, that, and what this article showed, this is an article that gets quoted quite often in patient pamphlets, is that possibly the use of hormone replacement therapy, so estrogen in particular, may worsen seizure activity. So that kind of worries people a little bit because there is this historical idea or, and probably um, a correct idea that estrogen in high doses has a pro-convulsant effect. So, but the, the, the reality is, is that this is from 1999. We're in 2024 and we know, and um, if there's some general practitioner colleagues in the audience, that hormone replacement therapy has really changed. We're not talking about just tablets now. It comes in patch form. It comes in pessary form. There's topical gels. And we're much better at controlling the levels of estrogen. We also recognize that some women require progesterone. Some women require testosterone. So I, I, I would be hesitant to um, base all my advice just on this article. C Cynthia also looked at um, seizure frequency and how it interacts with women with epilepsy, so the converse uh, with respect to menopause. And if you have uncontrolled epilepsy, there is some evidence showing that menopause can come on maybe three to five years earlier. So that's something to bear in mind and, and recognise that it is a two-way street. It's not just menopause affecting epilepsy, but epilepsy can affect menopause as well. But again, this article is from about 20 years ago. I always remember my PhD supervisor reminding me that when it comes to a patient's concerns versus a clinician's concerns, there's often a bit of a disconnect. So we may be dissuaded as neurologists reading the literature saying, oh, you know, the hormone replacement therapy might worsen your seizures, but you're dealing with the symptoms of menopause. So you're dealing with the hot flushes, you're dealing with the mood, you're dealing with the sleep, you're dealing with the memory. So we have to meet each other halfway and we have to weigh up the risks and benefits. Uh, the, essentially, we have to recognise that studies are conflicting, data is limited, and um, it's important then to sort of create a group with you, me, the general practitioner or gynaecologist, and try and see if there's a way that we can help fix the symptoms as well as um, help control uh, seizure activity. And that may require a little bit more interaction, maybe a few more phone calls, but we should try and work together and find a way forward. So moving on to uh, a couple of other things that are important in the uh, post-menopausal menopausal stage. The fall in estrogen uh, does bring up the um, issues with respect to cardiovascular health. So remember at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned how estrogen was thought to have a protective effect against vascular disease. What, um, what they found is, is that while cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in men and women, we have a delayed presentation up to a decade later, possibly because of the estrogen. <coughs> being protective. In 2013, a national health survey indicated that women with epilepsy were actually more likely um, to report high blood pressure, stroke and angina pectoris than women without epilepsy. So this is something that's out there. This is a concern. 
and there is research probably again from about the 90s and um, early 2000s demonstrating that anti season medications may worsen your lipid profile but it's important to recognize that that hasn't necessarily been the only issue with respect to your cardiovascular outcome so it's not a reason to change your anti seizure medication it's not strong enough the evidence isn't strong enough having said that what we should be focusing on is modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And this is where we look at things like smoking cessation and we ask ourselves, are we doing enough exercise? Because exercise is really, really important. Even a brisk walk three times a week is better than nothing at all. Uh, now, um, looking at diet, I just wanted to do a little plug for a new uh, classification system. So again, in the clinic setting, we often talk about diet we often talk about ketogenic diet or modified Atkins diet, mm -hmm. but so many of you have actually suggested to me that you feel that there are certain triggers with respect to your food and epilepsy. Um, uh, and I think we're catching up now when we're looking at diet uh, and, and what the focus is, uh, is new classification systems that instead of you know the traditional food pyramid where you've got your carbohydrates down the bottom and then fats and oils up the top, we're probably asking you and me, me um, to avoid processed foods. And it makes sense, right? If a cheeseburger doesn't go bad on a shelf after one year, there might be something wrong with that food. We probably don't want that in our bodies. So it's important that we try and eat um, food that will eventually go off <laughs> because it's fresh. It doesn't have the high fructose corn syrup. It doesn't have all the additives that maybe we don't understand that interaction between our gut health, um, our body and our cardiovascular risk. Finally, bone health. So this is a very unsexy topic, but something that I wish I knew more about when I was younger. So for those of you who know um, Professor Dunn, he uh, he was my consultant even when I was an intern. And I remember oh, he'd always force me to take the stairs on ward rounds and here I am lugging behind him. And he'd always say, think of your bone health, Jackie. <laughs> um, yes. So he's right, he's always right. Essentially your, your bone mass is really at its peak in your 20s. And then after that, ladies, we've really got to, we've got to work on it. We've got to get out there, we've got to do the weights, we've got to do the walking, just do your best um, to really move it and help um, the bone resorption. So um, uh, estrogen, again, is protective for bone health. So as we get a, a little bit older, we're losing that estrogen influence, uh, your bones do start to resorb, which means that they lose that sort of structure and you're just more prone to having fractures. And unfortunately, as we all know, epilepsy also increases your risk of having fractures and certain fractures are extremely dangerous. For example, um, uh, people or patients who have a hip fracture do have a higher rate of death and um, other disease processes when they enter hospital. So it's important to talk to us about it. We often defer to your general practitioner because they can organise the bone mineral density scan and they can also look at your calcium and vitamin D levels and then, um, and then we would talk about exercise as well. So uh, lastly, I just wanted, uh, I think I'm going okay for time, I just wanted to touch on um, what I think we should all be talking about together and what are we doing in Western Australia to focus on women with epilepsy. So we have a nationwide Australian pregnancy register, which is really important. And what that is, is that's an observational cohort study. It does rely on you contacting the register. They can't contact you um, and giving consent for uh, us as a group to be enrolled. So it's really something to think about. It won't influence your pregnancy management, but it does collect important data that we can use to advise women in the future. There's also a pregnancy and epilepsy clinic um, run by Dr Gaitatsis, which I think is at the Parent Institute. Uh, and some of the measures that we've introduced over these last few years have had unexpected benefits. So for example, we um, started a public-based video EEG ambulatory program and I actually found that my female patients were more likely to agree to the intervention because it allowed them to stay at home and be the caregiver whilst they were having an important investigation. And so that's just something to bear in mind. And finally, um, up the top there is our lovely registrar, Dr Buckland, who is still completing her training, but I just wanted to give her a little plug because she is um, undertaking a fellowship at Queen's Square in the United Kingdom 
And she's looking specifically at uh, neurological conditions and women, and she's hoping to start a uh, women in uh, and neurology based clinic at um, probably multiple sites throughout Western Australia when she returns, uh, focusing on pregnancy and contraception, but I'm sure we could get her to look at the other issues um, with respect to women. Uh, Finally, um, for those of you uh, that know me, uh, I am doing a PhD looking at linked data in Western Australia and we're uh, analysing midwives notification data from 1980s till now, as well as emergency department presentations, specifically looking at epilepsy. And I think it's important for us to do local research, to have local numbers, because all the studies that I've talked to you about today have come out from of the United States. They've come out from the United Kingdom. Um, a lot of the epidemiological studies have come out from Scandinavia, and we're very different. We're different um, uh, in terms of our regionality. We're different in terms of our ethnic makeup. On all of these things have to be taken into consideration. So hopefully, watch this space, we'll be able to come up with some meaningful data to help influence clinical practice. So I just wanted to leave you with a couple of quotes before I finish. So this is, um, I actually don't know where this quote came from, but I know that Michelle Obama once said it. So I just wanted to say, even though the, the name of my um, talk is a bit of a Debbie Downer, you know, being a woman is hard. I, I actually find um, women an extremely important source of professional and personal support. I, I really think it's important for us to recognize that there are strong women out there. We want to know them, we want to be them, and we also want to raise them. And it's important that we recognise the difference between men and women, not to favour women, but perhaps just to bring things back to a more equal level. I think we're getting there, okay? This is a quote from one of my favourite authors, Arundhati Roy. I think w the research is catching up. We're slowly recognising that things need to be tailored, more personalised. And um, I think also it's important to say that despite it being maybe a little bit harder, given the different hormonal changes and other hurdles, I wouldn't change being a woman for anything. And um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about this today because it's brought up a lot of questions for me for future research too. <laughs>